The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Perpetual is a dynamic, active manager offering an extensive range of specialist investment capabilities, including Australian and global equities, credit, fixed income, multi-asset, as well as environmental, social and governance, designed to help meet the needs of clients across Australia and New Zealand. Underpinned by our long-standing and market-leading Australian equities capability, Perpetual also offers an extensive contemporary range of funds. As one of Australia's longest-serving and most trusted investment managers, our long-standing commitment is to deliver superior outcomes over the long term to clients. G'day. Two weeks in a row, I am uh, filling in for my friend Jess, who happens to be on the other side of the world, enjoying herself, uh, just going through, what would you call it? Uh, too much fun, I think is probably the correct answer. Uh, so I'm filling in for her for the second week in a row. But uh, Kev, mate, it is great to have you on to chat all things advice tech. So thank you for coming on. Hi, Clayton. Hi, everyone. Yeah, it's um. It, this is this is a conversation that we'd been, you know, loosely planning for a couple of months, and uh, and when it just so happens that I had a uh, a you know a spot to to fill, I, uh, you were the first person I kind of thought of this week. So one of the interesting things that I've found about chatting with you over time, Kev, is uh, you're you're a tech guy, right? Who got dragged into financial planning? How does that even happen? Like, how did you start? I'm sure at university or wherever you studied, you weren't thinking, oh, I can't wait to start building SOAs. How on earth did you end up in financial planning? Okay, well, it started off with me uh, trying to finish off my double degree with a master's in uh, uni. Right. And um, who could have guessed? I was studying master's of biomedical engineering. Yeah. Which is totally what I'm doing at the moment. <laughs> totally. Um, but um, through the requirement of needing to get some industry experience, um, I was looking around and had a, a friend of mine who said, hey, my business is, uh, my company is looking for, a, you know, a tester. Are you interested? And I thought, cool. I went for it. Uh, expected, you know. No mm. pay as an intern for work experience. <laughs> yeah. But it turned out um, it, it was pretty much career for life. Um, so <laughs> pretty much they, they offered me, a, a, at that time, I feel it was a very good role for myself to start in um, the business as a test analyst. And it was at a coin software. Right. Um, so pretty much um, I think Macquarie would have just done the transaction with coin and right. I was one of the very first staff that they kind of recruited up um, and yeah ever since I've been uh, stuck in the industry for the good I hope <laughs> <laughs> well it's kind of interesting right because you know when I first started my financial planning business in 2013 um, I was with Hill Ross and Hill Ross is owned by AMP uh, and they're I think it's finished now, but there was a huge decades long, you know, uh, partnership between Coin and AMP. And so when I first started um, in my own practice, I was using uh, Coin and this was, you know, 2013, 14, 15, 2000. I think, I think by about 2016, I'd moved across to midwinter, but certainly the first few years I was, um, I was using Coin 
And but I assume by 2016 you were well and truly had moved on from coin, right? Yeah. So I um I had a pretty interesting um lot of lots of uh, role changes in coin. Um, thank thankful for the great leadership team that gave me a lot of opportunities. I went from you know tester to developer to account manager to institution account manager mm. um, on, on the professional services team. So I was working with various different um, companies on customizing or implementation of coin. Yeah. Um, and then in 2008, just before the GFC hit, fantastic time to leave the work, uh, <laughs> leave a job. Yeah. Um, I decided to go into a, a startup. Didn't quite work out. So um, came back to the industry, but sit on the other side, which is a uh, Suncorp, um, which is a client of Coin, and kind of understood how the client side work and how everything kind of pieced together to me. Going, all right, this is how vendors think, this yeah. Is how, um, clients think, and um, thankfully, um, the executive manager at that time, um, Laura, I still remember her name. I still um, talk with her. Um, she encouraged for me to start the business and share the experience with peers around the industry and, and that's the birth of YTML mm. which was the pre um, pre rebranded raw and pre rebranded dash yeah what what would you say is the big difference between client side or call it advisor side and and tech and dev side what do you what do you see is the diff, the main difference and then I'd like to sort of build on that and say what over the over the many years that you've been, you know, I guess a couple of decades now that you've been involved in advice tech, I'd really like to sort of explore what you've noticed in terms of the emphasis of change. So I guess first things first, what's the difference between the client advi- or, or advisor side and, and the dev side? So um, I would say it all depends on which role you play in, in a business, right? <laughs> Um, so when you're on the vendor side, um, you need to consider for all the other clients that you have. So you need to make sure that anything that comes in, you need to consider all the possibilities of breaking anything for your clients. Um, or, or is this something that your other clients would need? So there's a fair bit of analysis that's required. Um, so that's the mentality, making sure that you're trying to satisfy as many people or as many clients as, you, as possible when you're making certain changes. Whereas obviously on the client side, you know, uh, you will be more thinking about this is for my business. This is what I need. And mm. you try and explain as much as possible in terms of you, your terms to the kind of, um, I would say, the, the intermediaries, which is normally the account managers or the project managers or whatever, which a lot of the times get translated differently um you will have seen some um, linkedin photos of how projects work starting from what clients want to what project manager sees it what business manager see uh, business analyst sees it and what the developers give you right yeah that 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 happens in the world right so um and, and there's a miss there's a lot of miscommunication and and a lot of the time it's not because people want it to be wrong it's mm. just you had different background, different terminologies, different definitions. Um, yeah, so so uh, the more experienced that people are in the project, um, obviously this miscommunication risk just reduces. So I guess this is where kind of um, when we started the business um, back then um, in 2010, that's the problem um, YTML solved, um, becoming the bridge between the client and the vendor, making sure mm. that um, the right things has been translated correctly. And a lot of the times um, we would also do the implementation work, obviously partnering with um, the vendors. And then, and then, so what would you, what would you say has been the changes in what advisors want from software over time how have you seen what advisors are looking to achieve from technology what i guess you know early in your career what was it and and what is it now do you think i think um 
the reality is um, advisors wants more as you go. And um, so let's say from the days that we um, you know, started consulting, obviously um, a lot of the, the efforts um, were spent on, you know, the delivery of the SOA, which is what, you know, um, today our business is still very obsessed in. So it's the different mechanisms of how do you establish certain processes to deliver all these SOAs effectively, um, as well as trying to achieve a zero post-merge um, outcome, which is very hard. Um, what is a zero be- post-merge? What's that? So zero post-merge means you know no editing required after gotcha. you right. um, generate the document. Um, it's very easy for a single topic fixed goal template. Yeah. <laughs> But um, as you add more scope into this um, or, you know, variables, yeah, variables into this, then the the difficulty of achieving zero post merge just, you know, increases exponentially as you add stuff. So I think that kind of still hasn't changed too much um, where a lot of the software um, needs are really to deliver that SOA effectively. Yes. Um, There's a lot of talk around whether or not the legislation will allow the SOAs to be shortened. Yeah. Um, Or or even even sort of cookie cutter. I think that that, there's always such a huge, um, I guess, competing agendas between, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll sit down, you'll talk to someone or, or you'll hear someone from ASIC speak and that they say, you know, we specifically don't want advice to all look the same. Right. And then you speak to, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, on the tech side and it is, we're trying to, uh, you know, get, um, a result of zero post, you know, creation edits done uh, so that it is efficient as possible. So the advisor, I think, is naturally on the side of the tech provider. And the advisor goes, yeah, of course, like I, I want as much work done with the littlest amount of work, or the most, the, the largest outcome with the smallest amount of input possible. And ASIC, ASIC sort of sort of it takes a bit of a, a different approach and and there is kind of this constant constant battle um, where industry is trying to be efficient. The regulators are, are trying to uh, to to say that's not the case. Um, and then I guess the tech providers are in the middle, trying to somehow deliver on both. And I guess I guess that would be a, a large part of where the difficulty lies. Now, if you kind of think about what what's occurred in the last even 10 years, but certainly since advice tech began, it's an industry that's grown substantially, I would say. Um, obviously, it's still not the size of the fund managers. Who, there's about a 1,000 of those. Uh, there's about 10 life insurance companies. There's about 10 investment platform companies. But these days, there's a lot of tech. There's a, there's a growing amount of tech. And everyone is trying to solve... Uh, things in different ways um I, from looking at it from sort of where i am the the you know and sort of watching the conversations that are going on inside of xy to me it looks like the whole industry as well as uh, the advisor conversation is heading towards efficiencies um beyond just the soa that that to me, um, so there's sort of like a pre SOA amount of work, uh, the data collection. Um, there is the post SOA work, which is sort of the, the transactions and the and the implementations. And then you've got uh, companies like say Iris, for example, who who obviously the largest, who you know can can theoretically do everything, um, but it's a it, it's it's a software that has like it it stays up to date, but there and it has a huge market share, but it isn't trying to um, build the the you know like the most appy 
thing imaginable. Then, then we've got mates like, um, you know, my uh, Adrian Patty with, with advice revolution. And, and he's trying to build sort of this really appy kind of you know, fact find. Right. And then, the, and then there's uh, companies like yourself where you've taken, you know, wealth O2 and raw and jammed them together and sort of, you know, now it's called dash and kind of looking to bring the SOA creation in and, and the, um, the implementation. And it's, for me, it, it's always a case of, um, like, do you go down the route of trying to do everything in, in one system or do you sort of look to go best of breed, so to speak, at each, at each, at each point? And because I've seen pe- people get lost in, in both of those strategies. And I, I guess my question to you is, like, what do you think is the easiest approach for a financial planner in order to feel like they're on top of their tech environment. Okay. So maybe um, I'll I'll just bring the the discussion back to a little bit about, um, you know, the the past uh, consulting experience Um, when when we were still at the YTML stage. um, We helped a lot of groups uh, call up coin templates, uh, midwinter templates, advice and templates, explain templates. And um, every single time these templates are coded, it costs you know ten to a hundred k or yeah. even two hundred k a pop. Yeah. So you're thinking like you, you'll be thinking, why would you be doing that? Like it's it's a big decision for an advisor at the time to make if they're shifting software because one they have to pay for data migration, data conversion, and yeah. then pay for the change of the SOA for configuration. Yeah. And you'll be surprised. There are a number of groups that has kind of gone between softwares or have done the round robin yeah. um, and has paid for all these builds of template work. So um, our view is that, um, well, what we would like to achieve um, from the raw days, uh, or including now the dash days, um, is a integrated ecosystem that allows advisors to pick and choose whichever provider they want to use for mm. each step of advice process. Right. But integrated. What, so, does it, what does it mean to integrate? Like, how do you, is that kind of like Zapier? Zapier is a generic integration. Um, based on a automatic automated uh, workflow. Sure. So our integration is more based on from again coming back to the, the core reasons of why you're using your advice software. Two things: file noting of all the communications. Sure. Yeah. And two, advice document creation. Sure. These are the two main things that a, a advisor look for as a I would say um, it's a given feature right. for advice software for them to, you know, just take it on. Yeah, so, so our view is that with this integrated solution, um, the way that you, I mean, you're asking how does it integrate, well, it depends on which step of the advice process. So, for example, we uh, our, um, one of our very first blue chip uh, partners, Esther Will, who integrated with us, um, you know, we would integrate with their fact find because a lot of um, advisors use Esther Wheel for onboarding of new clients. Oh, oh yeah, Astute Wheel. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yep. cool. Yep. Um, so we would take all the fact find details in. Then let's say we integrate with the likes of uh, Omnium and Chan West, which then we will be pushing certain fact find fields to these providers to then allow advisors to model the comparisons of the financial products. So each provider should have different type of integration based on what the advisor is going to be using it for. Right. So, yeah. so, so, so I guess in terms of the question that I had before, do you work in one system or do you build your own system? You're <laughs> saying that, whatever the advisor chooses to do, there should be a solution for it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. That makes so, sense. What, what, so, what have you seen work well? Like, like, and, and, and as in, 
if you think about your, you know, two decades of working in advice tech, what, what are the kind of businesses that you've looked at and gone, oh, wow, like that is simple, effective and efficient? One of our um, key clients, um, uh, Kafka and Bond, they uh, run their business really well. They built um, like a, is it Trello? The, Trello, the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they built a Trello-like dashboard using raw um, dashboard, Right. run their workflow on it. They built multiple views based on, you know, um, users, uh, based on what they're interested in. So every day they have a really good snapshot. They click on it. They work on the workflows. And then pretty much, um, you know, they, they have both expand and um, let's say chat with Synomium. Yep. Um, but depending on which advisor or which scenario, they would be using certain licenses for that. Um, so the good thing about using Dash is that you can you can turn on next you can turn on Well Solver if you wanted to, right. and Chen West if you wanted to. Right. You just pay two licenses. Right. Um, and then uh, starting to generate SOAs without needing of copy and pasting from multiple different documents output it from various different softwares into one. So. Again, coming back to our obsession in document generation in the yeah. is yeah. that through this integrated ecosystem, we're able to collect all the data that advisors are collecting from various different apps that they're using within our ecosystem and then generating a document that reduces advisors' manual work um, yeah. to create that SLA. Have you seen, and, and it's sort of a, the way that you kind of describe mm-hmm. it made me think of a situation, like let's say, because hiring in, in financial services is very particular, very peculiar. Financial planning in itself is very peculiar because you you know, like a lot of people want to start their own business. And then a lot of people also don't want to start their own businesses, right? Um, and then you kind of get these sort of senior financial planners who who have worked in a number of different uh, sort of companies over the years who definitely have a skill set and an experience set, which might not, um, how would you put it, sort of reflect perfectly to this, the tech stack that their new employer chooses to use. So the reason I kind of bring that up is the way that you've just, ex- just explained it. It is if, if, if connections are a huge element of uh, efficiencies from your point of view. Are you saying that you could have different advisors using different tech stack within the same overall overarching environment? Absolutely. Is that that's crazy yeah. to me? I didn't I, I didn't realize that. Um, have you have you seen it work before? Well, within this practice, it does, right? So they kind of that's amazing systems. And pretty much all we do is um, code the, the the tables or the, the data differently based on which data input they. Wow. So do. advisor A really likes astute wheel. Advisor B really likes my prosperity. Advisor C really likes money soft. For example, like you keep going, right? Advisor intelligence, right? There's a million of them out there. And then they plug because the advisor has a, a particular, ad, because that's the thing, because ad, advice is different from every advisor, they might lean towards a certain type of advice and therefore may enjoy using a certain type of a uh, tech stack. And that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty impressive that uh, there's a, there's a, there's a business out there that can facilitate the unique journeys that each advisors want within their practice. That's actually really cool. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's what exactly what we want to achieve, giving advisors that flexibility Mm. But also giving um, licensees or practice owners the comfort, we also can um, provide like a white listing of providers. Let's say if certain, you know, principles of the business does not like a certain provider in the industry, we can rule that out so that advisors in their practice can't have access to that as well. So that's that 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 is also giving a, a bit of a defensive mode, right? Um, into this. So, um, you know, I always like to 
use the analogy that you know whenever we build technology, it's like playing a basketball game. I'm a massive fan of basketball. Cool. Um, you know, we we always talk about defensive play and offensive play. So when we design our solutions, we always think about how can we make sure that there's both plays going on at the same time, and which will result in helping advisors you know, delivering more and better advice, but at the same time, giving them the efficiency and the governance and, you know, the compliance requirements automatically out of the system. What, why is it, do you, and this is, this, this is something I've thought about for a long time. Why is it, do you think that there are companies like virtual business partners, for example, right? Or, 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 and, but there are, you know, a ton of other outsourcing, uh, uh, you know, power planning arrangements. In Australia, at a, at a litmus, sorry, not a litmus test, but it's sort of a, a stab in the dark. I would say maybe 200 contracted power planners that sort of, you know, typically one or two um, people shops. Uh, it's a, for, for as much as, you know, technology has tried to solve the issues of efficiencies and effectiveness, it seems to be that there's still a huge element of human involvement. It's just in a lot of cases that human involvement is is kind of outsourced rather than rather than uh, handled internally. Which you know I, I came across from accounting into power planning. It's a it's a sad state of affairs when when my previous profession is uh, is is getting outsourced. But I mean I get it because I also had a financial planning company and I also you know I had internal power planners sure, but I also used external and. Um, and there seems to be, and it's kind of, it's hard to explain, but as the advisor, there, there's an element of, of, I guess, security that you feel when you know that someone has cast their eye over it. It's kind of, it's, it's almost difficult to explain, but there is a, for whatever reason, it, maybe it's because technology can't, or at least I haven't seen it, bring to your attention not not so much the logical issues that exist within an SOA, but but illogical one, ones that are sort of I guess are, are hard to pick up in 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 code. Um, so, you know, for example, if there was a goal that stated, you know, you you want to ride a horse in the savanna desert in twenty years from now, right? Like that, and and then and then and then at no stage during the SOA does the advice actually address because it's, it, it's a very strange request and, you know, how do you articulate that, you know, it, in automatically. So it, it almost seems because humanity is not able to be put, you know, able to be codified and everyone has such weird, I guess, unique goals as you're sitting in front of them discussing what they want out of life. It, it does seem like invariably it needs um, someone to look at it how do you how do you view you know in terms of tech and it and the relationship with power planners do you ever see a world where tech will replace power planners um i think no uh, i again it comes back to you know like i said earlier when we're trying to achieve a zero post merge if we can achieve that then yes you could probably claim that um you can you know, probably say goodbye to the to this role in in, in the career right. um, or in the industry, but um, it, it's highly unlikely pu- pu- purely because of the infinite permutations that we can right. get from um, our clients, um, and also you know the more scenarios we're trying to build into the template. Um, you know, the more complex it gets, which means a lot of the times, um, I mean, we can try and automate a lot of stuff, but there are still many things that you question, hey, um, it happens once every two years. Yeah. It takes me five minutes to write a paragraph yeah. to do this. Yes. Do you really want to spend 100K? <laughs> yeah. So, so there's always that, um, and I think based on that, there will um, always be um, room for post editing. And mm. when there's room for post editing, there will probably be you know the need of power planners since advisors are busy, mm. um, and a lot of advisors love to just outsource it so that you know you have 
someone doing it, and then advisors reviewing it. So at least you also establish a validation process as well. Which yes. Is good. So so that's my view. Um, but again, if we kind of come back to the um, the SOA itself, I think post editing is inevitable, but the present presentation of the um, document could definitely be improved a lot. Yeah, um, we <laughs> we um, you know uh, it's a it's a very hard fight with the regulators um, <laughs> or even the um, AFL, A- AFSL holders to try and reduce the, the length of the um, SOA. Yes, we have been reducing. I mean, we used to have like 400 page SOAs and now we're down to 100, yeah. um, but it's still 100. Uh, so, you know, our view is there must be a better way. Um, we, you know, there's no guarantee that it's going to reduced down to 25 pages yeah no it's, well, it's why why spend the time fighting for that mm. when you could probably just use technology to display the soa differently um in, in a digital um uh format that mm. is more easily consumable for the clients but still have the exact same content yes to make sure that the regulators and the fsl holders um have the comfort that the content has been delivered yeah. Well, actually on that, let's, let's sort of jump into the future a little bit, because, you know, one of the things that I find super interesting and we've spoken a little bit about um, is, is what I like to call genuine or real artificial intelligence, uh, which is, is less than 12 months old. And it's the third generation that's come out of largely open AI, which uh, was something that Elon Musk had a, had a big hand in launching. Um, and and, but at the same time, you've got companies like uh, Nod, Nod sort of, you know, a handful of years ago, pop, pop their head up and said, um, you know, we're here to create, art, you know, AI driven, um, uh, you know, SOAs. And, and that, that has sort of come to a conclusion at, at this stage. Um, maybe it was too early. I, I think if you can, you know, they would have only been using generation two. So probably the capabilities weren't quite there yet. Um, but it was an, it was an interesting take still. And I know it, it gathered a lot of attention. Just, it was, it was sort of the first piece of advice tech that was, you know, at, quote unquote, appy and it was funded. And, you know, there was a couple of big names behind it. And then you've also got the FPA who have come out and uh, said, you know, video SOAs, now uh now uh, the ability to be i'm not sure how it's done but you know the video so if if video soas are on the horizon you know and and undoubtedly artificial intelligence will come back into the process uh you know, maybe not for a handful of years still say but you know un- undoubtedly that'll happen what do you kind of see as as if you look over the horizon, and I, and I think probably your answer in regards to what advisors find most important at this stage is sort of interconnectivity and, and and flexibility, and I love that. What do you kind of what do you kind of see if you look over the horizon as what's next? Maybe it's it's maybe it's not next week, but what's what do you think's coming next? That's coming back to um, your your question regarding the AI. So, I mean, Nod's got a fantastic um, concept and we were really excited when they came out as well. Actually reach out to Joel um, when they was released to uh, work on the integration. Uh, unfortunately, they went to uh, a, a conclusion stage where I think um, before we could take that AI step, the step that we need to solve first is the reg tech component. If we can solve that first, mm then yes. you can move into AI generation. And when I say the red tech component, it's the like of, you know, Art- Artemis from Redmarker, um, uh, you know, Sammy uh, or uh, Tick, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where they would do all the, um, I would say, scan of mm-hmm. the SOAs. Yes. Um, but it feels like at the moment, a lot of these scannings are hardwired rules. Yes. So if we could actually have AI-driven rules 
been built into this way it just learns based on what will get published on the next day of you know uh, legislation and it automatically generates the rules and then checks the SOAs. That yeah. Would be Once you yes. get to that, then you can generate the SOAs in a compliant way. That's my view. We're probably just not quite at that automation stage yet. I mean, yeah. Tick and Sammy are doing fantastic jobs at doing what they're doing. But in terms of where we want to achieve, really, in the fully automated area, probably not quite there yet in terms of AI and machine learning. Yep, totally. What, what, about, what about video SOAs? Yes. So in, in regards to video SOAs, I think um, what FPA is trying to promote is rather than having a document SOA, you record the video, but within the framework. Our view is that I think the, the, uh, what AP, uh, FPA is trying to do is trying to take you to an extreme, just to think about what can happen in the extreme world mm. uh, and then see how providers in our industry can take that extreme philosophy and build towards that. I think mm. that's what API's uh, intention is. Um, and our view of that is um, rather than having an advisor recording um, SOA live, which, look, you know, I get really nervous when recorded live, even now. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, advisors probably do that day in, day out. But again, we're humans. We make mistakes. And sometimes we make mistakes without even knowing it. And now you're asking advisors to record that, which, you know, may trigger risk um, within the video, probably more risk than the SOA if they forgot to say stuff or if they say more than what they're supposed to do, that kind of stuff, right? Um, yeah. And let's say if they're flicking around the, the laptop, this is all recorded. They flick to somewhere, something that they're not supposed to flick in, what are you going to do? It's actually, you, br- you bring up a really good point. This would be the antithesis of efficiencies, wouldn't it? If you, if you sat down to video record every single SOA, you would, I couldn't imagine that would be highly efficient. It, it's, oh, almost okay. as if, it's almost as if you'd have to do the whole power planning work and then sit down and record it as well. Well, they're, they're recording it with the client. It's actually a client presentation. That's the oh, effect. right. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So I think FPA is not tackling this from an efficiency perspective, but as a, as a new concept. Mm. Um, whereas um, the way that Dash um, delivers our view of how this should be, um, you, know, um, you know, taken up by the industry is, you know, it, it should be a combination of, a digital SOA where it's a consumable interactive advice document that attracts the consumers to read and try and understand um, the SOA. And at any point of time, have all the right or, or all the opportunity to ask questions and automatically track that. And then if advisors like to, they could also um, have this, uh, sent out together with a video avatar that explains the text or the content or the graph within right. the way. So that, right. you know, it's not really just visual, but it's also, you know, on your, um, with your ear, you can hear. Yes. And you've got a, a avatar there that tries to explain things. You can feel like if that avatar is the advisor themselves, um, I'm, I'm just imagining, um, remember, I think it was Windows 98 where Clippy was on. Uh, yeah, yes. the, it it's, yeah, so it's, it's like the advisor head, just like, hey, I'm, I'm Mr. Clippy. Come mm-hmm. click on me if you need an explanation. Yes. So our view is, um, you know, we can't change the legislation. Sure, yeah. At least now. It's really yeah. hard. Let's try not to change that. Yes. Let's figure out another way of displaying this or deliver this, but also with a bit of a human touch mm. and a little bit more medium in terms of visual, audio, um, yes. tracking, um, time tracking, whether or not the client has actually logged in and read it, uh, commenting it, version controls, all that in one package. And then at the end, when the client accepts, then it goes to file notes. 
One of the things that you said before was kind of interesting uh, in terms of it, uh, you, you know, maybe the future is uh, an engaging SOA or, or no, no, sorry, not engaging, interactive, I think was the word used. If I think back to to my SOAs, they were neither engaging nor interactive. Um, it's something that I've spoken to Jackie uh, Henderson at um, Advice Intelligence about as well is she has a view that that SOAs can be interactive. What what do you mean by an interactive SOA? In, interactive means um, the charts or the graphs are inter, like dynamic. Um, it's infographic, so it's it's doesn't look like just charts. Right. So you, so you can toggle. Off. You can you can you can move things around. Yeah. Or you can interesting. Even, you know. Like a um, you know speedometer, where right. once you load it, it goes ooh, right kind of um, experience. And then the next stage is probably even having a a calculator on there. Just goes, hey, if you really want, you can play around with the numbers here. Right. So um, you know, maybe like a slide bar on how much, like a salary sacrifice kind of thing. Okay, so I give up. Two hundred dollars per week, but it only has an impact of one hundred and fifty dollars per week. But I end up with you know three hundred thousand dollars extra in retirement or whatever. Yeah, and then you just track that, um, send that data to the the advisor. The advisor comes back with a new SOA and get it signed. Right? That's super interesting. So then, all oh, right, and I, and I mean, and the advisor would have to have a pretty clear. Um, I guess response to whether they felt that was the right idea or not, and, and that that is really the value that advisors create. That's right. That's amazing. Advisor, right? Oh, okay, I like it. So, so, so you can try. They can say this is what I want. And yeah, the advisor can go. Well, have you actually considered that other stuff as well? Yes. Oh, which is a huge value add, right? Absolutely. That's an interesting concept. So you, it's almost. Yes, the interactivity is cool or engaging, but the purpose of it is to generate a conversation and, and an ability to show value that, yes, it's great that you, you want to do this. However, blah, 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 blah. Considering your best interests, this is what I think. You know, I like that. I really like that. I, I you know, I'm pretty bullish on human led advice. Um, and I really like that as a great way to wrap up this, uh, conversation, Matt. I think, I think that's a very cool sort of next step on what's where the horizon's going. And, and, um, yeah, I think it's going to formulate uh, a bit of my thinking about where I think advice is going. So mate, I really appreciate you coming on. You're, you're, I don't think, um, I don't think I've ever sort of, out of the, we've done over 500 Australian based podcasts at this stage, which is really hard for me to even fathom but um i don't think i've ever had someone on you know who's a biomedical engineer turned uh advice tech uh developer and and now you know head of product and um yeah i just i, I really want I, I we've had some interesting conversations and i'm really happy to sort of bring those conversations to the podcast so mate thank you very much for coming on thank you Clayton. thank you everyone